loves. Once again, I am Simon3 and this is my kitchen. Finally, as promised, I have that Critical Role recipe for you. I was so surprised when I heard Ashley mention it on episode 135 of Campaign 2 in Critical Role. Um, this is surprisingly enough the second Ashley based recipe that I've done. Uh, I also did her uh, purple jewel cake, which you can find a link to that up here, uh, and that turned out delicious. Uh, so I'm hoping we can do the same thing here today. So hold on to your seats, everyone. Get ready as we make fancy dunamancy noodles. We are going to begin with our onion here. You can see I've already chopped up half of it. We want these to be uh, about a small to medium chop. This is an excellent dish to make while watching the final episode of one of your favorite shows uh, because if anyone catches you crying like a little baby, you can just blame it on the onion. Uh, particularly if you get a strong one like I have here. Whew. Oh, God, it's pumpkin that did me in. Moving on to our garlic. As you can see, I've already uh, finely diced most of it. I did leave one here, so you can go through the process again. Easiest way to peel garlic is to crush it with your knife. If you want to do just a little magnified gravity a little bit and crush it that way, that works too. Uh, but this saves you spell slots if you use your knife like that. Okay, cut off the root of it and then just finely dice it. Like I said, with uh, my atrocious knife skills, no one wants to see me uh, dice an entire head of garlic. I'm showing you how to make this dish. I don't need you questioning whether or not I'm even proficient with cooking utensils. But once we have this all diced up, then all that's left is to cut our peppers, strip some of the thyme leaves, and then it's time to get to cooking. For these peppers, we're using shishitsu peppers. These are part of the recipe because there are several variables involved with the way that they are grown, including their exposure to sunlight during growth, how much water they receive, uh, to the point where it makes it a bit of a gamble. Most of the time, these are mild, almost sweet peppers, but there's somewhere between a 1 in 8 and 1 in 10 chance that these are going to end up being spicy, and that possibility is what we're looking for here in this recipe. We aren't making these into two small pieces because we will eventually be blending all of this. The reason I'm cutting it at all is just to make things a little bit easier for our blender. Now I have some of my time here. I'm just going to pull along the stem. For our time here, I'm just going to rip off some of these leaves. Depending on the freshness of your time, you might be able to just uh, run your fingers along the stem backwards to remove the, the leaves. But sometimes they, uh, they can get a little bit wilty a little fast. And it's a little harder to remove them that way. You want to make sure you reserve a couple of sprigs of thyme for finishing the dish at the end. So we'll just uh, put those away for now and get back to cooking. The exact amount of thyme needed isn't really a um, concrete thing. I'm going to give it just a very loose chop here to release some of the flavor. Uh, but use however much you want to. Just do what makes your food heart happy. As for our tomatoes. We have two cans of whole tomatoes. 
every time. I buy whole tomatoes for this, and they always end up crushed. I don't know if it's the gravity or just the hopes and dreams of the Mighty Nine. Now let's get to the actual cooking. Over here on the stove, I have a large drizzle of olive oil already preheated. And I am going to add my onions. Going to be cooking these just about until they're soft. Keeping them moving frequently because I don't necessarily want them to brown. I just want them to soften and cook through a little bit. While they're cooking, be sure to hit them with a little bit of freshly ground black pepper and a dash of kosher salt. You can sort of tell by sound once these are softened. Earlier, when they were still completely raw, they would clink around as I stirred them. But you don't hear that now. That's because they are soft enough that they don't clink against the side of the pan as I mix them. So that means we're ready for our next step. Now we're going to add our garlic. All of it. You can, of course, use less if you want. But don't be afraid of flavor. We're going to mix that around to get it coated with some of the uh, onion juice and get it in contact with the heat. We're going to let that heat up just for another minute or two until the garlic becomes quite fragrant. That is smelling pretty good. So let's move on again. Now we are going to add our thyme, our peppers, and we want to get that dried thyme in there too. Make sure you don't forget that. And then our dunamis. Just a little splash of that. We don't need much. That's going to turn everything kind of an unusual color. <laughs> so next up, we are going to add our tomatoes. Under normal circumstances, we would let this simmer for about five minutes, and then we would crush these tomatoes. But they've already been crushed, so we can avoid that. We don't want it to get too hot yet, though. So I've gone ahead, I've killed the heat. It's still quite warm, but I'm going to give it a second to cool down before we start our next step. Okay, I have my Ninja blender here. If you don't have a ninja, that's fine. You can use a regular blender or just a reskinned assassin. No one will know the difference. And now that this has cooled just a little bit, we're going to slowly pour it into the jar here. And let's give this a whirl. You can make this as chunky or smooth as you'd like. Personally, I like it as smooth as everybody's favorite floaty hot boy. Once that is the consistency you want, we're going to go ahead and return it to our pan. Natural ones happen sometimes. You can see it's a much smoother and more even texture. So we are going to leave it here on about medium heat, mostly covered, and let this simmer for a while. In the meantime, we're going to get started on our pasta. For our pasta, we are going to start with about equal parts all-purpose flour and semolina flour. We have some eggs, some olive oil, and some salt. 
So we're gonna start off by mixing up our flowers a bit. And then digging a little well in there. And we are going to crack our eggs directly into that well. We will then add a drizzle of olive oil. And a pinch of kosher, kosher salt. And we are going to start by beating the eggs. As we mix this up, we are going to incorporate more and more flour. And it takes a little bit of patience. But eventually you can get there. And eventually you will reach a point when it is too sticky to mix by fork. So that's when we go in with our hands. If you have a bench scraper, this is a great time to use it. I do not, so I just get to make a mess. We're going to end up with a shaggy dough, kind of like this. And once we have that, we are going to start kneading. There we go. Nice and easy. This is going to develop the gluten in the pasta and give it a nice tough chew. But we need to do it a lot. So we are going to be kneading this for about 10 minutes. By hand. Just before I started on my pasta, I started getting the water boiling. I've been at this about five minutes now. We're only halfway there, so I still got some work to do. But I did want to say one of the worst parts about making a hand kneaded pasta like this, especially a dunamancy noodle is that after about five to seven minutes of kneading, a wizard might have to make a constitution save. After 10 minutes of kneading, we are rewarded with this beautiful disc of pasta dough. So we are going to wrap that up nice and tight in plastic wrap. Try to keep any air from getting in there at all. And we are going to set this uh, aside for about 30 minutes to rest. It has been about 30 minutes, so we are going to get started rolling out our dough. Don't throw away that plastic wrap, we'll use it later. First thing we are going to do is liberally flour every surface. The table, the dough, our hands, the rolling pin, everything that's going to be in contact with this dough needs to be floured. And then we are going to go ahead and start. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to laminate it. I'm going to give it just a cursory little roll here and fold it into thirds. And then roll that again. And then fold this into thirds. And roll it again. And now, once that has happened three times, it's your turn to roll. So we are going to just start by getting this quick flat. And then that's when the real work begins. It's going to take a lot of effort, but be patient. 
you're going to roll it and it's going to spring back and it's going to look like you didn't do anything at all, but keep working it. Sometimes progress is harder to see than you expect. So just don't give up. Keep rolling out those corners, extending the edges, and just keep on going until you get it nice and thin. <sighs> if you have a pasta maker, this is an excellent time to use it. When you make this pasta, you can use only all-purpose flour instead of also adding in some of the semolina. Uh, I like using both because it gives the pasta a slightly grittier texture that I like and using two different flowers makes it fancy. Oh man, I don't know if it's all the work or if it's the fact that I'm standing right next to the stove, but it's pretty warm in here. Could really go for a ring of fire resistance right about now. After you've been rolling for what seems like six or seven years and you are just coated in flour, we finally reach a point where we are ready to cut this. Now you could cut along the edges to get a nice pretty border, but I worked hard to get this pasta and I don't want to waste any of it. So I am just going to roll it exactly as is and cut it like this. Make sure when you do this you are using a sawing action. You don't want to pinch down on it because that will make it harder to uh, unroll later. As thoroughly coated in flour as this is, I'm hoping we don't run into an issue. But weirder things have happened. I like to use just very little pressure, just the weight of the knife and go back and forth, and it saws it through nice and clean. So once you have them all cut, I'm gonna grab a plate and unroll them. And as planned, they are sufficiently floured enough that I am able to unroll them without issue. And now here we have our beautiful plate of pasta. Oh, we're gonna cut that one more time. It's a little thick on the end. We are going to give this one more sprinkle with flour and toss it a little bit just to make sure that they don't stick together too much. And there we go. We have a nice little pile of noodles here. We are going to cover this once again with plastic wrap until we are ready to go. All right, I have moved our sauce over here to this side so we can get them both in frame. It's been bubbling away nicely. And now we are going to add about a tablespoon of honey. You can go more or less as you like. But um, as Merchant pointed out, in a video that you can find right about here. Bees are known for their ability to travel through time. As of right now, they are not disappearing, they are just going to a different time. And that's why we haven't found any of their bodies. So that's why we're adding some honey to get a little bit of that um, time shift in there. And we are going to uh, make sure that gets nice and mixed around. And give it a taste for seasoning. And 
Hmm. We're going to add some freshly ground black pepper. Like to get a lot of that in there. And a generous pinch of kosher salt. Anytime you are making a sauce like this, where it will be simmering for an extended period of time, you want to make sure that you wait and season it like this at the end. Because if you season it and it tastes perfect, and then you evaporate half of the liquid in it, it's going to end up being considerably saltier than intended. So. Always season at the end for a sauce like this. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay, so now that our sauce is where it needs to be, we are going to cook our pasta. Homemade pasta takes considerably less time than the dried stuff. So, we are going to put that in, and I am going to mix it with tongs. To test the doneness of your pasta, never, under any circumstances, throw it against the wall and see if it sticks. Not only is that a terrible method for testing pasta, but with this kind particularly, Sometimes the gravity stops working on it and it's going to stick to the ceiling or the wall regardless of whether it's done or not. If you want to check to see if it's done, just taste some. Once it is time for plating, we are going to put our drained pasta here on a plate and top it off with some of, some of that lovely dunamancy sauce. Now this is a vegetarian version of this dish uh, to follow uh, Mr. Clay. However, you can easily add meat to this uh, by either putting in some ground beef, some ground pork, or even some crushed up crickets just before you begin the simmering process. To top it off, we are going to grate on some fresh cheese. I like using the microplane because it is a very fine grate and it just melts into it like the arms of a lover. You can put however much cheese on it you'd like, of course. As you can see, I am a big fan of cheese, so I like to go a little bit overboard. Then. To finally finish it off, I'm going to put on a grating of fresh nutmeg just, just for some more um, earthiness to it when we're done with that. Oh, I almost forgot. We needed that time from earlier. We're just going to top it off real nice and pretty on top to make it fancy for our fancy dudamancy noodles. And there we are, loves. Fancy dudamancy noodles. I hope you enjoyed watching this as much as I enjoyed making this and will enjoy eating this. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Don't forget to love each other. Goodbye, loves. Mm. Oh, man, that's really good.